Hello and welcome back. I'm Dr. Mark D. Baldwin and today's lecture is on composing a literary analysis. Today I'm going to talk more specifically about how to write a literary analysis. I'll also discuss some basics of literary criticism and what constitutes a good thesis statement. In the previous lecture I talked at length about the aspects of objectivity, subjectivity, absolute versus relative truth, and facts versus opinions. The element of ambiguity plays a large part in all three of those sets of oppositions. Ambiguity means having multiple interpretations, and certainly a subjective viewpoint informed by a belief in the relativity of opinions is highly ambiguous. In the world of nonfiction discourse, ambiguity is a vice. We have a need to know exactly what each of us is thinking and saying. In art, however, Ambiguity is a virtue. Art is inherently ambiguous. In fact, in most cases, the more ambiguous a work of art, the better it is. Think of Picasso's paintings, or Dolly's, or Beethoven's symphonies, or Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture. There are as many possible reactions to them as there are people experiencing them. In the analysis of art, in this case short stories and poetry, you can interpret them differently and not be wrong. So be comfortable with ambiguity. Ambiguity is your friend. Since art allows for multiple interpretations, the chances are increased that your interpretation is valid and defensible. The problem is when people get frustrated and see one definite interpretation or need closure to a story, wanting to know what the ending means. The great Romantic poet John Keats had some good advice. He had a theory called negative capability, which he described as the necessity of being able to live with doubts and uncertainties without any irritable reaching out after facts. In the analysis of short stories and poetry, you will find many uncertainties and have many doubts about what it all means. Don't get irritable and stressed looking for definite answers. There usually aren't any. There are many different critical theories or approaches to analyzing literature, but the one most accessible and natural to most of us is reader response. As I suggested in the last slide, since art is ambiguous and seems to exist for the consumption of the audience, in this case the reader, that ambiguous character of art invites and empowers the reader to go with his gut response to the work. Thus, the reader response approach encourages and allows your intellectual and intuitive reactions to the stories. You may bring your own life experiences, your knowledge base generously to bear upon the material. It's a very self-aware, self-reflexive approach, allowing you to draw analogies to insights from and suppositions about the stories from the stored wisdom of your own life. Now let's quickly go over some of the basic terminology of short stories, highlighting a key point or two about each. The plot is what happens in the story. In most stories that's easy to comprehend, but in some stories it's not. Sometimes the plot itself is ambiguous. The characters are the people in the story. A useful way to look at the characters is from a psychological stance. What makes them tick? What motivates them? What do they want? What do they lack? The conflict is the story's problem or set of opposing forces. You don't have a story without a conflict. The themes are the meanings, morals, lessons, or messages we can infer from the story. How can we universalize the story, applying its plot and resolution, its character's growth, change, or stasis, to our own lives? The setting is the time and place. The most important thing to notice about the setting is whether the story could have taken place in other times and places, or is the setting of this story the only possible setting for such a story to happen? Then there's the symbols and tone and style and numerous other aspects. I suggest again that you consult your various supplemental sources, texts, and the internet 
for any additional information you may need to write your own analysis. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground and you're ready to read the stories. What should you do? Read carefully, taking notes, paying attention to your own gut reactions. Trace those gut reactions. Do you feel tense, angry, indignant in any particular scene or line? Stop. Think. Dig deep. What in your life, in your past or present, may be affecting that emotion you're feeling? There's a funny line in a very funny movie called Best in Show when one character, reflecting quietly upon her life, says, I'm waiting for another message from myself. As you're reading the story, is your self sending you any messages in the shape of emotional reactions to what you are reading? And then after you've done all that, or perhaps while you're doing all that, try to formulate a tentative thesis statement. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And test out that statement on an audience of your peers and professor by posting a message on the discussion board. A little sidebar here. In this empowered environment of reader response, the triangular dynamic of the author-text-reader clearly implies that we, the readers, play an equal role in the assignation of significance or meaning. The significance of a piece of writing is not I repeat, not entirely what the author intended. That way of thinking even has a name. It's called the intentional fallacy. The author wrote the text and cut it loose like a child fully grown has been cut loose from his parents. Therefore, the text stands on its own merit, a free agent, if you will. Further, the author may not have even been fully aware of everything he was writing, suggesting, or saying in his text. We often say more or other than we intend to say. Thus, we the readers are full partners in determining the significance of a piece of writing. Look at it this way. The text means nothing by itself. Until it's read by an engaged, active intellect, it's just inanimate words on a page or computer screen. You, the reader, bring it to life. So don't be timid about inserting yourself into the text or insisting upon your meaning. Despite all of the preceding glowing advocacy for the reader response approach and the triangular dynamic of signification, a few cautionary aspects of these philosophies must be noted. First, these empowering critical approaches assume a sane, fairly well-balanced, fairly well-informed intellect doing the reading, reacting, responding, and analyzing. In other words, some interpretations are better than others. Simply because you see it in the text does not necessarily mean that what you see in isolation or through the lens of your limited knowledge can be universally applied or defended. For example, in the short story Soldier's Home, several of my students through the years have seen evidence, so they say, of incest. Personally and professionally, I have to completely disagree. They cite a young man calling his sister his beau as evidence there's something going on between them. What they failed to understand is that in those days, this was a very common term of endearment between friends and in no way indicated a sexual relationship. So be very wary of your own off-the-wall interpretations. Make sure you can support your views with solid textual evidence. That said, don't back down from a good idea or insight. Just be sure there's more than one clue in the text to support your point. A good, solid academic and scholarly thesis is a debatable inference about a narrow aspect of the subject, in this case, the story you're analyzing. So narrow your subject. The entire story is too much. A psychological profile of the main character is too much. A limited statement about the main character or theme is better. Make it debatable. For example, this is not a good thesis statement. In Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, the main character is an Englishman who learns many things in many foreign lands. That's a true factual statement, and that's why it's not a good thesis. Why bother to write about a fact? But here's a good thesis. In his travels, Gulliver learns that rationalism is overrated, and humans must tap into their intuitive emotions in order to survive. 
Now that's a good thesis statement, precisely because it is not a fact about the story. It's an interpretation, an angle, an argument that needs to be supported. As you're reading, be formulating tentative thesis statements, looking for evidence to support them. But also, note carefully if there's any evidence in the story that may refute your thesis. You cannot ignore opposing arguments. That's shoddy and dishonest scholarship. I mean, it happens every day in every business and walk of life, of course. People often ignore evidence, data, or arguments that refute or disprove their own sacred beliefs, don't they? But they're not being honest with themselves or the world when they do. They certainly aren't scholars. So try to be a true scholar. Get in the habit, if you aren't already, of being intellectually honest with yourself and others. Don't fall in love with your opinions. Be ready to shed them fast, if and when you find evidence that they're faulty, incomplete, or misinformed. In the next lecture, I'll discuss the process of writing, going over some of the basics of composing an essay. For some of you, this might not be necessary, but you may pick up a few points nonetheless. Thanks for paying attention, and I'll talk to you next time.